Okay, introductions. That's what all the cool kids are doing. Okay, um, hi. Uh, my name's Rob. I respond faster to Tiger, and three years ago I began what became this show. It's a show talking about gamer culture and all the things that surround it. And when I started the show off, I made a promise, because I knew there was no way I would ever have to make good on that promise. And that was, if this show ever got picked up by a major website, that I would do one show topic that, um, yeah, then, yeah, and here we are. All right. Let's do this thing. I'm not wearing it. Shush, we're starting. The reason I balked on this one for so long is, well, this isn't a simple topic, and it opens up to a can of worms the size of Manhattan. And to be honest, being flamed by gamers is nothing compared to being flamed by psychologists. They'll mess you up, man. So, I'll preface this with a disclaimer. This is hardly a master's course, so please take this as the launch point to learn more about the subject that it's intended to be. Okay? Okay. I suppose the best way to handle this is just to dive right in. Modern games have a problem. How do you keep gamers interested in your product longer? You have to look at this from the game dev's perspective. Once the disc is out of the tray, gamers are either shelving it forever or driving back to the game store to sell it back, and the latter is just a disaster for a major studio. They don't see any profit from the used game market. Not to mention the rise of perpetual games like MMOs and world sims that absolutely need you to keep playing their game. So, how do they do it? There's a lot of techniques, but for the sake of this video, I'm going to be talking about behavioral psychology, or to put it bluntly, how game companies play you. In order to get where I'm going with this, we have to talk about behavioral psychology, and very specifically, we have to talk about the difference between operant conditioning and classical conditioning, and yeah, this is going to get really messy very quickly. In the interest of going to bed sometime before next Thursday, let's stick to the basics. Classical conditioning is stimulus-response stuff. It's learning new behavior through association with something else. So, for example, let's say you get sick after eating food from a certain restaurant. You later don't even want to go to that restaurant, and you don't even want to have that food again. Even the smell makes you sick. Even though it wasn't the cause of your being sick, you still associate your being sick with the food in that restaurant. This is basic classical conditioning. Operant conditioning is uh, more complex. Painting with the world's broadest brush, operant conditioning is changing behavior by the use of reinforcement to get the desired result from the subject, but it's actually a lot deeper than that. Here's where we have to get into the work of B.F. Skinner, who's considered the father of operant conditioning. Now I could tell you about it, or I could show you through the magic of virtual space. Okay, you ready in there? You have no idea how demeaning this is. <sighs> Come on, it's the big debut. We've got to go over the top here. Sure, so we can impress both fans of the show? Great idea. I never ask you for anything. Just this one thing. It's not going to kill you. Fine. <clears throat> oh my word, I am so hungry because I have been starved down to almost 75% of my body weight. Now I'm stuck in this box with no food in the dish and only this button. Mm. You're where he's pigeons, not mice, right? Just do it! Fine, fine, fine. I wonder what will happen if I press this button. A cheeseburger? Really? You're gonna go with an ancient meme? Would you perhaps prefer a brick of Gouda? No, this is fine. Nom 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 nom. Oh gosh, I press this button and I get food. This is awesome. This is the basic gist of the Skinner Box experiment. In this case, it's a positive reinforcement for behavior. The other method is a negative reinforcement with- So help me, you throw that switch and electrify the floor, I'll, I'll, I'll slash your credit rating. Go ahead, I got nothing in there anyway. I'll put your porn folder on Dropbox and I'll post the link on Reddit. The other method is called negative reinforcement. That is when something either good is taken away or something bad is added in order to decrease or discourage a specific type of behavior. I wasn't actually going to do it. Jeez. Good. Then are we done? Can I take this thing off now? Yeah, go ahead. Hey, you. It should be mentioned that it could be argued that everything in the human experience can be broken down into basically behaviorist terms. B.F. Skinner himself even wrote that there was no free will, there was just the illusion of it. You're just reacting to stimulus and what you've been conditioned to do. And a lot of people are going to say, well, I'm too smart for that. You know, I know what's going on. Well, okay, let me ask you a question. A couple seconds ago, when you heard that sound effect, how many of you guys looked onto another browser tab to see who messaged you on Facebook? Does the name Pavlov ring a bell? Hey, dumb question. How do you humans wear fursies for hours at a time? This thing is hot. Yeah, it's a lifestyle choice. People are weird. I need to go take a shower. See ya. So I guess the important question to ask now is, do game companies do this to its players? Yeah. Very yes. Because there's a lot more to this than just button mashing. 
What Skinner found out is if they'd give food to the pigeons on every peck, they would stop after a while because they were full. I mean, there's no need to continue the behavior once you're satiated. What he found was that if you have a various type of scheduling of events, you can keep a subject doing a very specific behavior. One of the, one of the schedules which is very effective with, with rats or pigeons is what we call the variable ratio schedule, and that is at the heart of all gambling devices and has the same effect. A pigeon can become a pathological gambler just as a person can. People gamble because of the schedule of the reinforcement that follows, and this is true of all gambling systems. They all have variable ratios built into them. If you're an MMO player, that might have made you feel a little queasy. I mean, if you know the random reward drops 5% of the time, you'll keep grinding away knowing that 1 out of 20 enemies are going to give it what you want, and it might be the first one, the 20th one, the 100th one. You don't know, you're just playing the odds. In fact, game companies can even tailor the techniques to whatever they want to teach their players to do. So if you want to teach a uh, new behavior, you go with a fixed ratio schedule, i.e. you do this X number of times and you level up. If you want to maintain that behavior, you do a variable ratio schedule. So let's say the thing you desire drops 1% of the time, go get it. If you want to slow players down, you do a fixed interval schedule, like daily quests. If you want to keep players engaged, you use a variable interval. So like the world boss spawns randomly around here, you just gotta wait for it to happen. Now, you can even discourage players from specific actions with negative stimulus. Skinner used electrified cages, but we don't have to be that drastic... yet. Uh, most games use a positive punishment, usually things like a death penalty, where you have to pay a repair cost when you die, or you lose point, or you have a 10 to 30 second respawn timeout kind of thing. However, they don't use negative punishment, and I really think they should in some cases. Like if somebody's being really trolly or really abusive, don't delete their account, because they're just going to make another one. No, 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 no. You take away their armor, and you take away their weapons, and you replace it with punishment armor and punishment weapons. And you tell them, okay, you can have your good stuff back when you can prove to us that you can actually actually play nice with other people. And then again, I'm a vindictive bastard like that. A part of me wants to branch off into things like token economies, or how operant conditioning leads to rituals and superstition, and stuff involving chain schedules, extinction events, but seriously, we'll, we'll be here all day if I get into that. Instead, I'm going to go back a little just to directly answer the last question. Are game developers using operant conditioning techniques to keep players engaged in their games? Yes, and they know they're doing it. This is an article on Gamma Sutra. Gamma Sutra? Gamma? Anyway, it's written by John Hobson. He's the head of user research at Bungie, former Microsoft Studios beta program head. He's also a PhD in behavioral and brain science from Duke University. He was involved with Halo, Age of Empires, Trial HD. So, this isn't just some random guy. The article pretty much breaks down how to use these operant conditioning techniques to keep players in your game. It also discusses finding the balance point of how far you can push players before they quit your game. Anyone currently playing Defiance can relate to the drop in reward that's going on right now. However, it's worth noting that in an interview posted after his Gamma Suit, he says, and I quote, I don't think that game companies are using behavioral principles any differently than any other industry. No one complains what their airline is addicting them when they offer frequent flyer miles or that their coffee shop is manipulating them by offering every tenth latte free. But when it comes to games, other people get a little antsy about this sort of engagement engineering in a way that they don't get about other products. He does have a point in this, but I want to point out why this is such an insidious thing for game companies to do. The term is called operant conditioning, and in that phrase, I am, you are, the operant. You are choosing to voluntarily change your behavior in order to get something that you want. All these game companies have to do then is create that want. Why do you think weapons have a rarity to them? We make a conscious connection between grinding on mobs and getting a reward. I mean, everyone loves getting rewarded, right? So, you logically know the drop rate is 1% in an item, and your brain turns that into, well, killing another 99 bad guys to get that armor piece, it's not all that bad. And then in some cases you figure, well, dropping 10 bucks in the cash shop just to get it now, that wouldn't be so awful, I guess. And in the worst case scenario, it's, you know, dropping 5 bucks into a virtual slot machine to get a chance at the thing, that's not so bad. Yes, I'm looking at you, Tryon, you know why. Even when we know that it's happening, we keep doing the behavior, and here's why I have a problem with these techniques being used in video games. 
A lot of the times, you can look at a game and see that it offers no real gameplay, only offering conditioning and reward systems. You grow a tree, you get a thing. That's not gameplay. That's a time-based fixed interval reward system. It's the main reason I don't play social media games, because I know they're all basically Skinner boxes. And this is why I'm not happy about the use of operant conditioning in video games. Hobson calls it engagement engineering. I call it a cheap way to keep people using your product. A game can cover a complete and total lack of gameplay with achievements and exclusive costumes and other Skinner box stuff. At that point, it's not even a game. It's just a reward for parking and looking at somebody's ads. I may as well put on the mouse suit and mash the red button myself at that point. So, what can be done to avoid this? Well, what I recommend is taking stock in the games you play. I'm going to speak in terms of MMOs, but this applies to a lot of the modern crop of perpetual and social media games. Ask yourself this. If the game had no achievements, no daily grind requests, no endless gear chase, no 24-hour cooldowns, and no cash shop offering you to speed up on those cooldowns, would you do it anyway? The games I keep coming back to? That answer is yes. That doesn't mean those games are flawless, they aren't, but it just means that they're games that I would play even without the rewards. I suppose a lot of this comes from being old school, because back in the day you wouldn't go up to a Robotron or a Space Invaders machine and they wouldn't have to rely... Okay, yeah, sure, they had like a free life at X number of points, so I suppose that's a fixed ratio reinforcer, but it's not like you walked up to a Defender machine, put in a quarter, and then you would just get an achievement for... Oh yeah, it's on Xbox Arcade now, isn't it? with achievements. That says something about the state of gaming, but I'm not entirely sure what. Normally this would be where I would put a funny little outtake or something that happened during the production here or a little skit, but in this case I want to hear from you guys. What do you guys think? I want you to leave a comment down below. Do you think that game companies are just gouging us for money and using these techniques to just suck us in, or am I kind of wandering dangerously close to tinfoil hat territory with all this? Or is the truth kind of someplace in the middle over here? Internet, go!